Yeah, I apologize ahead of time. I can't figure out how to get the microphone working, so it makes me feel like I'm in the Florence Library. I feel right at home. <laughs> Everything works great, so hopefully I'll talk loud, and uh, I think Tony can speak loud enough. As an attorney, I'm sure he has to be heard by the whole court. So. Uh, Franklin County, Tennessee attorney Tony Turnbow has studied the history of the Natchez Trace for over 35 years. His grandparents lived on his ancestor's historic early 19th century farm along the historic and colorful Natchez Trace Chickasaw Trail. Tony has recently released the third volume of a historical fiction trilogy for young adults, Fighting Devil's Backbone, set on the Natchez Trace in the early 1800s. The third volume is called Easy in the Den of Thieves, and I think he has some of those books for sale. Uh, we may have to have him come back and speak on those. Tony was a juror, and this is very cool to me. Tony was a juror in the coroner's inquest into Meriwether Lewis's death, held on June 3, 1996, at the National Guard Armory in Hohenwald, Tennessee. I wish I could have been there, but you can look this up online. Tony has a BA with a concentration in Southern history and a Juris Doctorate from the University of Tennessee College of Law, and serves on the board of the Lewis and Clark Trust and is also past president of the Natchez Trace Parkway Association. Also a member of the Alamo Society and the Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage Foundation, he has served on the Trail Heritage Foundation Governance Committee. Tony is the author of the 2018 book, Hardened to Hickory, the missing chapter in Andrew Jackson's life, a work of history based on unpublished documents which describe Jackson's first military command expedition revealing the future president's fight with General James Wilkinson, the general in command of the U.S. Army, who at the time was also a spy for the Spanish government, and who many historians, including I think Tony believe, was ringleader of a group of conspirators who assassinated Meriwether Lewis on October 11, 1809. Tony's program will center around the book. He does have copies here. Uh, it's one of the best books I read in 2018. I cannot recommend it enough. My copy's on the table over there. I'm reading it again. So he has copies for sale if you are interested. Among other local historical figures, the book references the Chickasaw brothers, George, Col George and Levi Colbert, as well as John Coffey while he was still a colonel. So uh, Tony also has an author's website, the address of which I forgot to write down, but you can Google him online and find his author website. His program today is called The Natchez Trace is a Proving Ground for Andrew Jackson. So he'll go about 45 or 50 minutes and then take some questions and then we'll have a little bit of concluding business. So uh, please welcome Tony Turnbow. Thank you, Lee. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, hopefully I can speak loud enough uh, for you all can hear me. Um, I was thinking back in, in, about the topic for today's lesson, which came from church. Um, that topic of uh, today's presentation. When I was growing up, I remember seeing the uh, programs on TV about the watering holes in Africa, about how all the animals spent time in their own groups but they had to have water. And so at times they would come together at the watering hole and for the first time they would see animals they had never seen before. And it was a proving ground because the strongest animals got to the water, the weakest animals didn't. And sometimes the, the weaker animals were forced out. And thinking back to the trace, really in my research, I think we can establish that the old Natchez Trace, like many trails in the country, was a proving ground for lots of people. It was where warriors met and where warriors were warriors won and warriors were defeated. Uh, it was a place where individuals met and the strongest survived and the weakest didn't. And that really ties into the, to the presentation today about Andrew Jackson and James Wilkinson. I think the Natchez Trace served as a proving ground for Andrew Jackson. Let me give you a little background about the Natchez Trace from what I found. If I can figure out how to work this. It should be the down arrow button. It goes the down arrow button. Let me see. Or maybe the, oh, yeah. there it is. Um, this is a picture of the old trace and out of Mississippi that still exists. Um, the Park Service says that most of the Natchez Trace uh, melted back into the woods, I think they said, or something like that. It just disappeared back into the woodlands. But that's not true. We're still driving on a lot of it. And uh, in the 1930s, when the Natchez Trace Parkway was built, they discovered that about 40% was still being used by the public as, as, a, as a highway. 
Um, but I'll, I'll begin the story here with James Robertson. When he came into Tennessee to form the Cumberland Settlement in the mid-1700s, um, it was really what they call the wilderness. And it was inhabited by the Chickasaw Nation primarily, the Cherokee, a little bit to the east of us, the Creeks to the south, and the Choctaw farther south than that. And uh, the biggest problem they had were the Creeks, who understood what it meant that the, the, the settlers were coming into this area, they were going to take away their homeland, and the Shawnee to the north. And the Shawnee and the Creeks had intermarried, and so there were common trails that went back and forth. And both uh, presented a real danger to the Cumberland Settlement, so they built blockhouses to try to keep the, uh, the Creeks out and, and the Shawnees out, but there was a constant warfare uh, as they fought for this territory. The two civilizations were coming together and they were fighting for the same ground. And these are just uh, some of the uh, weapons they used at the time. Um, to put it simply, life at that time was brutal and, and uh, warfare at that time was very brutal. A good friend of mine from Mississippi who studied the area and studied some of the fights said, you know, reading some of the descriptions is kind of like watching the Texas Chainsaw Massacre about how tough it was. And, makes us appreciate the kind of the lifestyle that we have now. We think sometimes things are not going so well, but we have no idea what our ancestors went through at the time. So Robertson was encountering this uh, all the time in, um, in the Cumberland Settlement, and then the settler was being killed about every 10 days. And it was not uncommon for the family to get up in the morning and by, by evening, two or three members of the family would, would have been killed by the Indians. So he's, he was looking for some solution. And so President Washington reached out to the, the Chickasaw and the Choctaw, tried to encourage them to become friends. He offered them a cotton gin, which the Colbert families took advantage of, and became some of the largest cotton producers in the country at the time. But then he suggested that Robertson reach out to the Chickasaw to see if they could come to some accommodation. And so about 1783, Chief Piamingo, or Piamingo as the Chickasaw call him, um, came to Nashville with a delegation. They spent two or three days, Indians take time to get to know each, the people they deal with, spent two or three days in, in playing games and ball games and races. And when they finally decided that they knew each other well enough, they sat down for a talk. And Pio Mico had a suggestion. He suggested that they build a shorter road between Nashville, the Cumberland Settlement, and the center of the Chickasaw Nation, which is pretty much uh, at, uh, at uh, Pontotoc, Mississippi. And he presented to um, a Robertson this bag with elaborate beads, with doe skin, and he said this was to symbolize that their hearts would be together. And then he presented them a pair of moccasins, again with elaborate beadwork, and he put these moccasins on Robertson's feet, and these are the actual moccasins he presented. These are the Tennessee State Museum now. And he said this showed that the Chickasaw would follow him anywhere. He also tied a string around his finger to show a symbol of friendship, but he had a, he had a request of Robertson, and that was that they create the shortest route between Nashville and the uh, Pontotoc Settlement. So if you look at this old map of Nashville, this is, the, this is Muscle Shoals, and this is the Tennessee River going north. At the very top there, and I don't have a pointer, but you can see a road going east-west that says Glover's Trace. And if you follow, if this map doesn't show it, but if it were to go all the way down, it would come through what is now Shiloh, then going down south into Pontotoc, Mississippi. That was the old Chickasaw Trace. The Natchez Trace that we know today didn't exist at that time. Piomico, who was called by the, the settlers as the mountain leader because they had lived in East Tennessee, suggested they build a shorter route going from Nashville, coming down to uh, just west of the shoals at Eastport, and then going farther south. And so Robertson agreed. This would form a friendship between the two civilizations, and they would build this shorter route and it was at that point that Levi and George Colbert uh, began to operate a ferry there at, uh, at Westport to ferry soldiers across the river. And it became um, a, a route of, of peace. You know, the, the Chickasaw called this their peace path up through the nation. Um, one of the men who came to Nashville about the time they were building this was Andrew Jackson. And uh, to give a little background, most of you probably know the story of Andrew Jackson. Uh, during the Revolutionary War, his father was killed. Uh, he was there as an orphan with, uh, with just his mother. And he volunteered to serve at age 13 as a messenger boy in the Revolution. Um, and it was said at one time, he was at his cousin's house and you know, the British barged in. They were ransacking the house and British soldiers spied Jackson standing there. And he ordered Jackson to walk over, stoop down, 
and shine his boots, which was an insult to a young boy. And the story was that Jackson did not stoop down and shine his boots, but he stood up. He said, I'm an American citizen and I demand my rights. Well, to a British soldier, that was an insult. This young boy had stood up and demanded his rights. So he took his sword, he reared back, he struck Jackson across the head. Jackson raised up his right hand in defense, but the, the sword cut a gash along the, the front part of his head, creating a scar. So if you saw Andrew Jackson, one of the first things you would have noticed would have been the scar on the front of his forehead. So as I say in the book, Andrew Jackson never needed medals on his uniform to demonstrate his bravery. The scar showed the courage that he, that he had. Um, during the war, Jackson and his brother were thrown into a makeshift prison with criminals uh, for serving the, in the revolution. And his mother secured his release and on the way home, his brother died. And Jackson followed along, I think some 40 miles, uh, barefoot in the snow. Uh, then his mother got sick from the same fever and she died. And Jackson was alone as an orphan. Uh, and at that, at that time, even adults didn't live very long, but it was very rare for young people and even orphans particularly to survive. And Jackson not only survived, but go on to become president of the United States, which again showed the kind of will that he had to survive and to succeed. Um, but from, I think from that point on, Jackson wanted to become the next General George Washington. Most boys at that age idealized the, the general uh, who was able to secure their freedom from the British, and he wanted to become the next general that men would look up to who would wipe the British off American soil. And he began to prepare himself after <coughs> going through the teenage years uh, to reading the law, and he moved to Nashville to become a federal prosecutor. And he, he discovered this Natchez trace that went from Nashville down to uh, down to New Orleans and Natchez, and um, he built he opened a store in Nashville, and he would he would barter with the farmers. They would bring the farm goods in, he would purchase them, and he would take the farm goods, put them on boats, and they would go up there down the Tennessee to the Ohio, down the Mississippi, and he would sell them in Natchez. And it became such a lucrative business that he built a cabin down in Natchez. I call it his bachelor pad because he was not married at the time. He would later marry in a few years. Uh, and he would travel back and forth on the Natchez Trace, which was very dangerous at the time. Most people would band together for safety because there was all, practically no law enforcement on the road. Uh, but Jackson apparently never seemed to have a problem taking that danger going up and down the Natchez Trace. Um, let me go back here. I think I'm going back the wrong way. Well, I gotta go up, sorry. So I want to introduce you next to his nemesis, General James Wilkinson. Wilkinson had a similar childhood in that his father died when he was young. And the one thing he remembered when his, before his father died was he said, son, if you ever put up with an insult, I will disown you. You'll never let anyone challenge your, your reputation or your character. And then his father died, leaving um, Wilkinson uh, fatherless to grow up and, and again wanting to succeed, um, to, to prove something maybe to his father. Uh, Wilkinson was different in that he grew up in an area where the Washington and, and the other leaders were, uh, were living, and he took advantage of those family connections. The one talent that he had was that um, he was a people person, and, and he could make people like him, but he was also very manipulative with people. He could look into someone's heart and know exactly what it was they wanted and figure out a way to use that against them to get what he wanted. He would eventually become uh, what I call the J. Edgar Hoover of his day. He, he eventually got dirt on everyone, and he was able to use that for his own advantage. He worked his way up through the Army, uh, and after the Revolution, when the Army was reorganized, Wilkinson wanted to be the primary general in charge of the U.S. Army um, because he had opposed Washington with the cabal and some other things. They, they chose Anthony Wayne instead. You've probably heard of Mad Anthony Wayne. Uh, Washington, uh, Wilkinson... I did not want to put up with that. And when he realized that he probably would never succeed to the highest levels of power in the United States, he turned to our enemy, Spain. And he told Spain that if they would begin to put him on their payroll and pay him, that he would give them military intelligence and, and work to try to present, prevent the uh, Americans from ever moving west across the Mississippi. And the Spanish finally agreed. They put him on their payroll. 
and, and named him Agent 13 on their payroll. And he began to take money from the Spanish government. He was soon able to, um, I had the trouble, I'm sorry. I'm going all the way here. I'm going to go back. Nope, wrong bit. Uh, he was soon able to um, work against um, Anthony Wayne uh, at every turn. And, and at one time, when, when Wayne was about 200 miles from any supply depot out in what's now Cincinnati, and Wayne was getting ready to fight the Indians in the area, Wayne discovered that his supplies began to dry up and that his men began to get sick and began to die and never realized that Wilkinson was in control of all of these supplies. And Wilkinson was able to use this against Wayne and suggest that Wayne was just incompetent. He couldn't take care of troops. He was, he was trying to undermine him at his best. But Wayne still survived. Um, and then one day someone was cutting a tree by Wayne's tent and the tree just happened to fall on the tent and barely missed Wayne, just broke his leg. But Wayne survived that. Uh, and then the third, third attempt worked. A uh, short time later, Wayne began suffering stomach ailments under the treatment of Wilkinson's doctor and he died suddenly. And um, it is believed that Wilkinson assassinated him. Wilkinson did write a letter to his Spanish paymasters with crocodile tears because Wayne had gotten evidence that Wilkinson was working for the Spanish government. And so in his letter to his paymasters, he said, poor General Wayne, prosecution is in the grave with General Wayne. Almost admitting that he had, he had assassinated General Wayne for his position. He admitted he had undermined his position at every point. Well, this is something that he will use against uh, Andrew Jackson later on. So as these two men are preparing, you know, Jackson works his way up to the Tennessee militia. Uh, he's never has an opportunity to fight any battles, which is how real generals earn their, their stripes or their, the respect they get from their men. He fights a few Indian skirmishes, but nothing more. But he's able to become major general of the, of the Tennessee militia. And at that point, it's not really clear whether the federal government or the state government uh, is more powerful than the other, where there are a general of the state government is more powerful than a, than a federal government. All that still has to be worked out. Well, Wilkinson then begins to look at, at the future of the continent. And for a long time, I, I suggested that the, the Natchez Trace Parkway, or the Natchez Trace, was really a product of Thomas Jefferson's vision for the, the country. I'm beginning to think it's probably General Wilkinson's instead. Um, Wilkinson was able to convince, was able to convince um, uh, Jefferson of this later on, but he began working on this before Jefferson even became president. So he looked at the at the the, the, uh, the image of or a map of the continent, and a lot of military men at the same time did the same thing. And what they realized was all of the Americans they settled along the East Coast, and they gradually had moved out toward the Mississippi River. The Spanish owned everything, controlled everything west of the Mississippi River along the Gulf Coast. The British still had forts along the the coast and around Florida and the Pensacola area. And what they saw was that there is this giant river going right through the middle of the continent, the Mississippi River. And whoever controlled, in an, in an age when they thought boating was, shipping would be the only way you would ever be able to move commerce, whoever controlled this river would control the future of the continent. And they looked south at the mouth of the river, or at the, at the base of that river, at the, the Gulf Coast, where all the shipping would take place. And they said, that's the spot. Whoever controls New Orleans, will control the future of the continent. Whoever controls this river will control the future of the continent. And so Wilkinson realized we have to be able to control this river. And Wilkinson built a fort uh, just north of New Orleans, Fort Adams, and um, built a camp for himself called Camp Columbian Springs uh, with palatial uh, houses that no one discovered until later on. Um, and he had in his mind that that would become the future capital of the United States. It just made sense to him that in an, era, in an era of shipping, and the importance of shipping, it didn't make sense for our, our capital to be far away on the west coast or the east coast that it needed to be New Orleans. And he, he said that he walked every mile, every inch, of in this southwestern area, which was then the southwest of the U.S., trying to figure out the best defense points. And he realized, too, that the other problem they had was that with a small army, then it was about three to 5,000 men, um, they had no way to present a force to resist a, an invasion if, if we were invaded along the Gulf Coast. Uh, most, of the, uh, most of the military at that time were militia who heard of the Minutemen, militia who would show up at a minute's notice with their own weapons, their own provisions, and be ready to fight to, to defend their own area. 
Uh, but the idea of moving a large number of troops down to the Gulf Coast just didn't, wasn't possible at the time. So Wilkinson realized they had to have a military highway, a wagon highway, in order to move a large number of troops south. And he began making his plans. And so when Thomas Jefferson became president, and this is a, a map showing the, uh, the, what's now the Mississippi area, but you can see this 500 mile expanse between the southern Tennessee area and then the, the Gulf Coast. Settlers had begun to settle the southern area, but in between was the Chickasaw Nation and the Choctaw Nation. Well, when Thomas Jefferson became president in 1801, Wilkinson approached him about building this, this highway. And, um, and pre there's, there's a pointer if you want to use it. No, a pointer? It. Okay, that might help. Thank you. Push the button. All right, I think I'm about through the map stuff. Um, um, building this, this military highway and, and gave him the reasons for it. And if you look at some of Jefferson's letters, he's convinced. He said, again, there's one spot on the globe that will control the future of the continent, that's, that's New Orleans. And so Jefferson agreed that they could begin having treaty negotiations with the Chickasaw and the Choctaw, and um, that they would talk to them about building a wagon highway, which is unusual for the country to be a, one of the first highways for wheel travel, something that was not common at the time. It would also be one of the first federal highways. Uh, the Const Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, does not allow the federal government to build highways except for postal purposes, so they would have to call it a postal road for cover, but it would really be a military highway. And so they entered into treaty negotiations with the, um, with the Chickasaw in, in 1801, and in October 1801, secured permission by uh, George Colbert and the others, and I think of oh, this peace medal, is the one that was given to George Colbert at that treaty negotiation at Fort Pickering, which is now Memphis. And they pledged to Colbert this road would only be used for mail purposes and for travel back and forth to, to Natchez for commerce, and no bloodshed would ever be made on it. That was the sole purpose of it. They wouldn't allow anybody else to travel on this road. And Colbert agreed. The reason I think Wilkinson was behind all of this was it took Congress four or five months to approve this treaty. It wasn't approved until about April or May of 1802. But in December 1801, Wilkinson already had troops ready. He moved them to Nashville, he moved them down to the Tennessee River, and they began building this, this road even before uh, they had approval from Congress to build it because Wilkinson uh, was, was behind it. A couple of years later, you would see also the purpose of this road in this letter that uh, Thomas Jefferson sent to Congress. This is Morris Lentz, and you're watching North Alabama Local History. Uh, that's because they didn't want uh, anyone other than the Congress to understand what it was Jefferson was proposing. This letter is known primarily for uh, Jefferson's consent to get money from, from the, go get the government's consent to, uh, for the Lewis and Clark expedition. He wants $2,500 to send Lewis and Clark west across the, uh, uh, the, to the Pacific Coast really to find a military route, a river, where they could move soldiers to take over the West. What most people don't realize is half of this letter is devoted not to Lewis and Clark, but to this area, to the Chickasaw, Chickasaw Nation along the, along the Mississippi River and farther south of the Choctaw. And what they say here is we have to be able to take control of this land now owned by the Chickasaw and the Choctaw in order to control the Mississippi River. If we don't control the Mississippi River, we'll never be able to control anything else. And so Congress approved this, uh, letting them send Lewis and Clark west, but also letting the soldiers begin building this military highway and continuing to improve this military highway farther south. Jefferson's plan was not just to create this road for wheels to move soldiers, they have any wagons for the, for the equipment, but it was also to move settlers into the area because, again, they were relying on militia, and they thought if we were able to build towns in this area, then the towns would form militias and then we would have the soldiers that we needed uh, to secure the borders. And so they began building this, uh, building this military highway. They sent surveyors out. This is one of the surveyors they did. You see the Tennessee River there. And what's telling in this map, when they, when they build, uh, create this map of, of where they're going to build this road, is the writing there at the bottom. It's signed by James Wilkinson. And I don't know if you can read this or not, but that's his signature there. But he says that once this road is built, then this area will be secure and it will be laid at our feet, meaning we'll be able to control this land once we build this road. 
So the road was not just for military purposes, it was also to bring in settlers that would be able eventually to take, take over the land. And you can see this road there on the map going down into Alabama and Mississippi on some of these early, early Tennessee maps along there. Well, let me, let me stop on the slides there and, and uh, just tell you the story. As they're building the road through what is now Franklin or Williamson County, Tennessee, they're, they're cutting it, they're supposed to cut it in a straight line, the most direct line from the courthouse in Nashville all the way south into the, in the Indian Territory. And they start building it through this place you may have heard of Leaper's Fork. It's now kind of a country music haven. They're building the road through there, or cutting the road through there. And Andrew Jackson sees that and he says, this makes no sense. You're building this brand new interstate road five miles west of where everyone has already put a town, Franklin, and invested all of their money. That doesn't make any sense at all. So he persuaded the soldiers, he and his silent land partner, John Overton, who paid the soldiers as a federal receiver, and who owned land, just happened to own land this new road would run through if they moved it, persuaded the soldiers to move this road five miles west, right up through Franklin, right up through Overton's property, right up to Nashville. And Jackson got what he wanted. Well, the soldier in charge of, of the construction effort was uh, Colonel Thomas Butler, second in command of the U.S. Army. And, and Butler then had done this great favor for Jackson, but when Wilkinson found out, he was furious because Jackson, think of the two animals at the watering hole, you know, <laughs> Jackson had stepped into his, his turf, and he was furious, and he demanded that Butler be court-martialed. And Jackson began to appeal to Thomas Jefferson, and at first it seemed to work, but as he went back and forth, it got more heated. And from that point on, Jackson and Wilkinson became mortal enemies. Jackson wanted to destroy Wilkinson. Wilkinson wanted to destroy Jackson. Jackson began to suggest that Wilkinson was a spy. Uh, there were rumors around, and he was one of the first people to say, I think Wilkinson, Wilkinson is a spy. Well, it, it didn't work out for Butler. Uh, he was eventually ordered to go to Fort Adams to be court-martialed. He said that yellow fever was raging. If he went south, it would be a, a death sentence, and it was. He died from yellow fever leaving several orphans. His wife had just died uh, a few months earlier. And so Andrew Jackson raised those orphans at the Hermitage until they became adults, sent them to school, and some actually served them <coughs> later on in the war effort. But, but he, he and Wilkinson now are mortal enemies. Um, let, me, let me one more picture here of Aaron Burr. Here we go south here. There's some ends, we'll skip over those. Oh, here we go. Aaron Burr. So in 1807, after Aaron Burr shot, shot uh, Alexander Hamilton, few people realized that he came to Tennessee. And Burr realized after he shot Hamilton, he would never rise to the highest levels of power. He, needed, he wanted to be president or, or emperor or leader of some country. And Wilkinson saw that and he persuaded Burr that if he would work with him, they would create a new country seated in New Orleans um, that would become the, the powerhouse of this new continent. And then they could pull Tennessee, Kentucky, the Ohio Valley area away from the U.S. and eventually pull the whole capital to, to New Orleans and this would be a brand new country. And, and Burr could become emperor of this country and his daughter could become the empress mm -hmm. of this new country. And they gave Burr what he wanted. Um, and so Burr came to Nashville, but, but they had to have, have general, you know, they had to have troops. And here was Jackson who had a Major General of the Tennessee Militia, and he was closest uh, to the area of New Orleans. And they thought if they could appeal to Jackson, they could use his troops, and they could begin pulling this area away. And so Burr realized that, uh, Wilkinson probably realized that, that Jackson loved horses. And so Burr appeared on Jackson's doorstep one day and asked if he could board his horses in Jackson's stable. Of course, Jackson was um, flattered that the Vice President of the United States wanted to quarter his horses in his stables, he said, of course. And Wilkins, or Burr said he was just going south to New Orleans. He was taking care of some business. There were some people in this area that were very unhappy with the way things were going in Washington. He felt Jackson out for how, how aligned people in Tennessee were, and the country was very divided at the time. It wasn't really certain whether people west of the Appalachians would ever join with the colonies and keep this whole experiment going. Uh, so Wilkins, Burr was encouraged that he might be able to pull Jackson away. Uh, Burr came back a couple of times and, and eventually he said, well, I've, I've got approval now for a military expedition and we think you're just the man to lead it. And he said, you know, we're gonna go in, into uh, 
Florida, and we're going to push the British out, and then we're going to take control of Florida. And this has the president's approval. Are you, are you with us? And Jackson agreed. And so Burr reported back to Wilkinson. They go back and forth several times. Burr comes back and he says, well, the mission has changed now. In addition to Florida, we're going to go west and we're going to take uh, what's, what is now Texas, that part of Mexico, um, which would have given them more territory west of New Orleans. And the president's all for it. Are, are you in agreement? Jackson agreed. And, and Wilkinson knew that Jackson was strapped for cash at the time. He had several land deals to have gone sour. So Wilkinson said, said, we need someone to build boats for us. Can we hire you to build the boats? And Jackson readily jumped on that as well. And Burr handed him a note payable to Burr. And Jackson flipped it over and he endorsed the back to take payment for these boats. Well, that tied Jackson by his signature to this scheme that, that Burr had, whatever it turned out to be. Well, Burr went on and he reported back to Wilkinson and he made plans. And a few months later, there was a man who was traveling from New Orleans coming back who said he had met with people who had met with Burr and, and things were going well. And Jackson said, well, what's, what's going on? And, and the man said, well, don't you know what they're really planning? He said, they plan to create a rebellion in the, among the slaves in New Orleans. They're going to use that rebellion to rob the bank of New Orleans. They're going to take all the money. They're going to create a militia. They're going to march to Washington. They're going to turn out Congress, and they're going to assassinate Thomas Jefferson. And Jackson realized he was right in the middle of all this. And Jackson said, who's going to lead the troops? And he said, General Wilkinson will. Well, then Jackson realized he had been taken. You know, that, that Wilkinson was the puppet master and Burr was just a puppet all along. He had tied him into this, this great scheme that he had. So, so Jackson began writing letters in his defense. He wrote to the president telling him what was happening, but it was too late. Jackson was implicated. Burr went on with this. Thomas, Jeff Thomas Jefferson was very reluctant to um, have Burr arrested um, because maybe he was afraid of Wilkinson. Uh, but he let him go on down the Mississippi River. And finally, when Jackson, when Jefferson was told the ultimate plan was to assassinate him, that was all it took. And he said, arrest Burr. So he had Burr arrested on the Mississippi River. He had him brought back in chains to Richmond. And he was tried there, probably one of our first celebrity trials of the age. That's where we got our definition of treason for, for years. Uh, the former vice president was being tried for treason. Andrew Jackson was called as a, as a witness at this trial. Well, by this point, Jackson had figured everything out. And so he went to Richmond, and he stood there on the steps, and he gave these loud harangues, these loud speeches to anyone who would listen, that an innocent man was being tried for treason when the actual culprit was General James Wilkinson, who was a spy for our enemy Spain. Well, it's not time today to go into the ins and outs of the trial. Fascinating story about the trial of Aaron Burr. But Burr was found not guilty, primarily because they had chosen the wrong jurisdiction to try him. And so the trial was over, Jackson came back home. Everyone assumed Andrew Jackson was finished. You know, his, his, his career was in shambles. He was 45 years old, an old man at the time. This was it. But Jackson would never give up. That's one thing he had is this indomitable will to succeed and never give up. And so he realized that our country was headed toward these uh, potential war, a uh, potential war with, uh, with Britain. And if he could somehow work his way up to get the, the um, confidence of the federal government, when war was declared, Jackson was the only general in this area who would be have enough troops to go south to defend New Orleans, and he could somehow work that up. And so Jackson got his friends in Congress to actually push to go to war with uh, Britain to create the War of 1812, thinking all of this would somehow work to our, our advantage in, in this area, and that he would be chosen as general. Well, it is. His friends succeeded, war was declared in June 1812, but when the authorization arrived in Nashville to muster troops, it was very clear Jackson was not to be the man to lead the troops. That Wilkinson had somehow gotten to his friends in, in, um, in Washington and undermined Jackson. He was supposed to um, appoint, the governor was supposed to appoint a lower ranking general to lead them, and he was supposed to raise only uh, a regiment of 1,500 men, and the ultimate insult was Whatever number was raised, these soldiers were to march south to serve under General Wilkinson, which Andrew Jackson never would. So Jackson, because of his friendship with Governor Blunt, persuaded Governor Blunt nevertheless to appoint him as the general to lead these soldiers. And he raised a secret infantry or secret cavalry unit uh, under the command of John Coffey, 
of 600 soldiers that he did not have the authorization to raise. And Jackson's idea when he met with his soldiers and uh, his officers in Nashville in November 1812 was that they would treat General Wilkinson, who was camped there at uh, Fort Adams, the southern part of the U.S., they would treat him as an enemy to the U.S. government and that he would send 1,500 soldiers that he was authorized to raise in flatboats down the Mississippi River, but then he would send this uh, cavalry unit, the secret cavalry unit, down the Natchez Trace, and they would, they would surround Wilkinson's camp in a pincer movement, uh, take all of his supplies, probably take him hostage, they would take all of the equipment, and then these soldiers would then go down and push the British off the American soil of Florida, Jackson would become the next General George Washington and become the national hero. Um, and some of his officers said, that's, that's insubordination. You know, we're all going to be tried for, for mutiny for that. But Jackson persuaded them, nevertheless, that this is what they had to do to, to save the country. So he, he rendezvoused the, the, the soldiers. Over 2,000 men showed up, which is where Tennessee got the name the Volunteer State, even though Kentucky had raised a larger number. And when the soldiers arrived in Nashville, Jackson realized he was, he was a neophyte at this. He, he had not uh, planned as well as he should have. He didn't really understand the way things work. Wilkinson was still in control of the War Department mm -hmm. and all of this. And so the pay never arrived for, to, to pay them in, to muster them in. And they had to pay them advance pay in order to make the contract work. And so Jackson approached his friends and they borrowed the money from the Bank of Nashville to pay them in, to muster them in. <clears throat> and, then, and then soldiers set off. Uh, 1,500 down the Mississippi River, 650 down the, down the Natchez Trace. Well, the men on the flatboats had not gotten any farther than Clarksville, Tennessee, just outside Nashville, where they would pick up all their food. They stopped at the wharfs. They looked at the barrels. The barrels of food were half empty. Uh, the flour was molding. They opened the, the pork barrels. Jackson says the pork had not been properly, not been properly um, uh, cured. Yeah, And um, in fact, he said there were pig skulls even mixed in. Uh, with, a, with pork, and it would have made the men sick within a week. Wilkinson had somehow been able to manage all of that. Uh, but nevertheless, they, they arranged to find food, and they went on down the Mississippi River. When General Coffey got across the Tennessee River into the Chickasaw area here, they were supposed to have been contractors who had laid supplies of food out. There weren't Kroger's at that time, but laid supplies of food out along the way. The food was missing, and um, Wilkinson had somehow orchestrated this missing food. And so, Coffee approached the culverts and said, you know, we have to be able to uh, supply these young men. And the culverts agreed. And there were stories they told of the Chickasaw women carrying corn on their backs out to the road uh, to meet the soldiers to feed them. So the, cul the culverts helped uh, save General Jackson and his soldiers during this expedition. Well, they get down to, to Natchez. And as they're approaching Natchez, Wilkinson gets word that all of his plans have not worked out. Jackson is still headed his way. And so he sends Jackson the letter telling him if he'll stop short in Natchez, he'll find a fine federal fort there, Camp Fort Dearborn, where he'll be able to rest his troops and they can use that as a staging area. And then Jackson would be allowed to go on into Florida, wipe the British off Florida, and Jackson would become the next General George Washington. Well, Jackson falls for it and he stops at Natchez. He, he, find, he hears that when Wilkinson has arrived there as a general a few years earlier, he, it was like Nero coming into Rome. He want, wanted everyone to know that this great general had arrived. He was riding this uh, leopard saddle with a claw still attacked, and, you know, and, he, and he had gold spurs and all of this stuff. Well, Jackson plan, spent a lot of time planning his parade through Natchez because he wanted everyone to know that a greater general had arrived. He was going to take command of the Gulf Coast away from General Wilkinson. Uh, well, they hadn't marched more than six miles out of Natchez in the mud when they looked up on the hill and there was this fort Wilkinson had promised and rather than this fine staging area that's going to help him then go on to, to Florida, uh, he finds that it's old, it's rotten, it's falling down. He says there's a collection of filth inside that will make the men sick within a week and he realized he's been tricked. Mm -hmm. And within a short period of time, Jackson has to do what he doesn't and never intended to do because he realizes Wilkinson controls all the food, Wilkinson controls all the ammunition, Wilkinson controls all the transportation. He has to sit down and write Wilkinson a letter begging him just for the food to keep his young men alive. Now most of these young men are actually teenagers, some as young as 12 years old. Um, that was my alarm, tell me 45 minutes were up. Um, some as young as 12 years old, and when they had left Nashville, there was this grand ceremony with booming cannons and flying flags, 
and Jackson had promised them they would all return home as conquering heroes. And here they were, 500 miles from home, no way to get back, no way to be fed, and the boys begin to get sick and the boys begin to die. Mm. And Jackson has to do something. And Wilkinson lets him dangle at the end of this, uh, end of this string while the boys are they're having funerals more and more every day. And Jackson realizes he has to do something. So Jackson decides that uh, uh, he has to somehow get these boys back home. Well, when, when Jackson is at his low point, Wilkinson has an order delivered to Jackson, I think it's a forgery, supposedly from the Secretary of War, telling him that he is dismissed from service. Mm. And he's to leave all these boys behind. He's to take every piece of equipment he brought, even the tents, turn them over to Wilkinson. And Jackson is, is finished. And Jackson said, most of these boys showed up with just the shirts on their backs. They will not get back home if I'm not here to leave them back home. And some of his officers said, but if you disobey this order, you'll face a firing squad. And so he had to make a decision. Up until this point in his life, Jackson had pretty much lived for himself. You know, whatever he wanted, he, he worked to get. But this was the first time in his life he decided he would risk everything for these poor Tennessee boys he brought down with him uh, who would not survive to get back. And he said, I'll risk it. He said, I led them into the field and I will all risk and hazard leave them back home. So Jackson approached some of his friends in Natchez. He borrowed about $10,000 of money that he thought would secure some wagons, get some food, be able to go back up the Natchez Trace. And his plan was if he got back Halfway, he would send express riders ahead to Nashville and approach the Tennessee governor, tell him the problem. And he thought the governor would then bring supplies down and they would rescue the men. So he sends the express riders to Nashville, Jackson heads north. And as they're walking north on this last approach, one of the boys writes, some days they walk in swamps, waist deep. Some days they walk in mud up to their ankles. As the men are getting sick, Jackson gives up his horse and lets the sick boys, because the boys are beginning to get more and more sick, uh, to ride his horse. And he walks every step of this with him, up through the swamps, through the mud. So as they're walking up through southern Mississippi, one of the boys says, look at that old man, that man's tough. And one of the boys says, that man's as tough as hickory. <laughs> and one of the boys says, oh, that man's old hickory. And they began calling him old hickory. And Jackson heard it, and rather than chiding the boys, he... Uh, he realized that's probably the honor, only honor he would ever get for this whole expedition. He, he accepted it as, as the honor that it was given. He got the boys back up, about to the Choctaw Agency, about halfway up to Mississippi, and they got word from the governor that the governor said he had no authority to give any more supplies to Jackson. Jackson was on his own. And Jackson suspected Wilkinson had somehow gotten to his, one of his best friends, the governor, and secured this so that Jackson would be defeated. But he wouldn't give up, and he told the boys they had to do whatever they could to get back to, to Nashville. And so as they came up to the Tennessee River, they looked across the river, and on the other side were wagons waiting for them with the families of the boys who had gotten word that their sons were in danger. Uh, they were starving to death, and the families had, had pulled together all the support they could to bring wagons and food down to meet the boys to bring them back home. So for Jack Jackson, that was a rescue. His, son, his boys were rescued. Uh, they wouldn't die under his command. But for the man who wanted to become the next General George Washington, it was a humiliating defeat. Because here, the sons had to be rescued by their own parents from this general who couldn't provide for them. So Jackson goes on back toward Nashville. They're back to the, back to the same public square where they had the grand ceremony, the booming cannons and everything. And the newspaper said it was a quote unquote, pleasant little ceremonial. As Jackson faced his enemies there on the public square, having led these 2,000 Tennessee boys, incurred all of this debt and some of the boys had died. And rather than coming home in, in the fine uniforms of heroes, you know, the, the uniforms were falling off of them and they were straggling and they were dying. And Jackson, it appeared, had been utterly defeated. This was it, he, no way he could recover from this. But what they didn't realize in retrospect was that Jackson had never commanded uh, an expedition. He had never commanded a battle. He had never done what it took to um, uh, earn the respect of these boys. And most of these boys were green recruits. Most of them had never been away from home. They had never served in any, any military activities other than militia, county militia duties. And so this whole expedition had trained them to serve in the military, to take orders, to endure the hazards. And when they came back from this expedition, they were no longer just the green recruits. They had been hardened. Jackson had been hardened by this whole thing. Within six months of Jackson coming back to Nashville, Word arrived that the Creeks had attacked Fort Mims in Alabama. 
And Jackson called these same boys to meet him at Camp Blunt in what's now Fayetteville, Tennessee. And these same boys that he took off and led back showed up at Camp Blunt. And they did that because Jackson had not abandoned them when he was ordered to. He did not give them up to, to die there 500 miles from home. He was their general. So he hadn't earned their loyalty by battle, but he had earned their loyalty, the loyalty mm -hmm. by risking his life and risking everything he had for them. That's how Andrew Jackson became Old Hickory. So the, in that, in that uh, aspect, the Natchez Trace was a proving ground. You had these two generals fighting for command of this continent, and, and they were fought it out as to who would succeed um, and who would survive. And all that took place because of this, this Natchez Trace. So to give you a little bit of, the, of uh, what happened in the end, of course, you know, Jackson defeated the Creeks, and, and a short time later, he went south with a lot of these boys, and they faced the British Army at New Orleans, and the British Army at that time was the mightiest military in the world. They just defeated Napoleon. Uh, but by that time, those boys were seasoned, and they defeated the British Army within the final battle within 30 minutes, I believe. Uh, it was a very lopsided victory. And Andrew Jackson was a hero. The boys were heroes, and then in that time, they did all come home. As, as the conquering heroes, but it set Jackson up to become um, president of the United States. But in that, in that aspect, Jackson did become what he wanted always to become, which was the next General George Washington to wipe the British Army off American soil. And so at the Hermitage, they will say, if you look on Jackson's tomb, it doesn't say President Andrew Jackson, it says General Andrew Jackson. And they asked him what, what he wanted written on his tomb, and he said being general was a higher uh, honor than being president uh, at that time. So that's something that he always wanted. So that's the story of Andrew Jackson and General James Wilkinson on the Natchez Trace. Uh, one, more, one more story is that as part of this, when, when Jackson was able to use his um, influence later on, um, he, he asked the federal government to dismiss Wilkinson from service because Wilkinson was a spy. The man wouldn't serve under him. And the Army finally acted on that and they moved Wilkinson from the southern coast to the Northern Theater during the War of 1812, where it turned out what everybody suspected was Wilkinson could not fight, he couldn't command. Every time there was a battle, Wilkinson developed a severe case of diarrhea and went to bed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after the War of 1812, he was relieved from duty. And when the war, went, when it was downsized, and he moved to Mexico and still tried to use his influence uh, with, with intelligence, but by that point, the, what he had wasn't, uh, wasn't worth anything. And so he died in poverty there in, in Mexico. He had what, like eight court marshals that he yeah. did before they finally were able to? Yeah, they called him the general who never won a battle but never lost a court martial. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, once he was court martialed by the Congress, uh, which I'm not sure if even they even had the authority to do that under the Constitution, but he was called to be questioned by Congress for being a, a traitor. And it was during mm -hmm. that period that Meriwether Lewis died, which is another story. Oh, yeah. And I'm working on that book now. Great. Yeah. So uh, I'm not sure we are on time, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. I think we're yeah we're close. Was, was Burr court martialed also? He wasn't. He wasn't court martialed. He was tried uh, for treason, and then he um, when he was found not guilty, 